Um, joining me now is Do uh, Dr. Tony O'Sullivan, who's co-chair of Keep Our NHS Public. Um, hi there, do uh, Doctor. How are we this afternoon? Good afternoon, Patrick. Good afternoon. Um, what I wanted to talk to you, just before we get on to the question of, of A&E, what do you make of Unison accepting uh, an offer and potentially the RCN not? Well, I'm, I'm campaigning for the NHS and I'm fully supportive of the NHS staff in their demands and uh, I, I'm not um, taking sides in the unions. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm not taking part in the negotiations. So it, it, it re remains to be resolved how the unions between them take the matter forward. Um, can I just say one thing, though, that when you're talking about uh, to the previous speaker that if inflation comes down, shouldn't they give money back? I, I think you're misunderstanding what inflation is. And when, when inflation falls to a lower level, prices don't fall, they stop going up at a faster rate. Well, it is they, expected that prices, food prices particularly, will begin to fall. Uh, I do yeah, understand, yeah, well, I do well, understand well, inflation. And the reason yeah. I was asking that question is because many people say, either tongue-in-cheek or actually, that, mm -hmm. you know, oh, well, if they get an inflation-busting pay rise, are they going to give it back when inflation goes down? So my job here, uh, Doctor, is to ask questions that other people would want answering, not necessarily just my questions. Uh, um, I understand, I understand okay, that. But, good. But Let, let's when, move when, on and talk about A&E. Yeah. &E. Um, there is uh, one in 10 people attending A&E in England are facing dangerous weights. Now, we, we knew this, didn't we? What's new in these figures? Um, it, well, I would say that there's nothing new other than the, the embedding of this crisis and the failure of the government yet again to respond to it. Um, it's, it's important that you're covering this story. Uh, and you, you, you probably know that the Royal College of Emergency Medicine has, has come under quite a lot of criticism at, at the end of last year and early this year when they were saying that between 350 and 500 people were dying avoidably because of these delays. And, and then fairly robust uh, research and challenge from um, from BBC fact check showed that they were right. And what they were saying is that uh, for patients that are waiting 12 hours or more for treatment, there's about one in 72 additional deaths. So if you have um, 125,000 people in February alone waiting for 12 hours for assessment and treatment, and then 40,000 of those who are uh, um, deciding to be admitted to hospital waiting a further 12 hours for a bed, that, that's an extraordinary risk. So I, I, I agree with you that it, it's a, a, a shocking statistic. If we knew that there was a jumbo jet crashing every week with 500 people on board dying and we knew how to avoid it, and stop it happening, and we did nothing. That's just unthinkable. Uh, but, what but this is it not easier to fix? I mean, I, I, I question why so many people, obviously, why so many people go to A&E when it is neither an accident nor an emergency. So the solution would seem to be fairly simple, and that is to increase GP appointments and to make sure perhaps there's a GP in every A&E because those people are dying also because the wrong people are mm. using A&E. And by the wrong people, I mean the vast majority. Well, uh, these are important questions that you're asking, but they are quite complex. I, I don't know if, if I could just try to explain some of that. Um, of, of course, there are always some patients who will go to the wrong place initially, and that, that's a matter of, of public information, and it's also a matter of accessibility and availability. Um, so if there are not enough GPs and patients cannot get those appointments, not because GPs are lazy, not because they're no, playing golf. No, I didn't say that. Yeah. No, I know you, no I, I know you didn't. I, I, I know you didn't. I'm just saying that, that, it, that they're working incredibly hard and there just aren't enough of them. There's at least 7,000 vacancies in GP and assessments are that they need a, a, at least 10,000 more uh, GPs than there are at the moment in place. So that's certainly one reason why patients go to A&E. But the, the other thing is that, you know, uh, studies of 
of the seriousness of patients attending um, A&E, the acuity is, is, is the word that has been used, has actually risen steadily over the last few years. Um, so the numbers of, of people attending A&E have, have not actually gone through the roof. They, they have they've relatively stable compared with the, 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 the feeling that everything's out of control. But the, the, the level of seriousness of illness of people going and the percentage of people who are attending A&E who then need to be admitted, that's gone up hugely. Uh, and, then, and then you have the total failure to address social care uh, and the failure to support people who don't need to be in hospital support them safely. But, but does this all stem back to that lack of uh, GP appointments? You're saying that the numbers are going up of people who are perhaps presenting too late, uh, having not been able to see a GP weeks before when they had a twinge, let's say, and then it gets worse and worse and worse and they end up in a and E. I I mean, it just seems to be a systemic problem. It, it, well, uh, what you just said, I completely agree with you. It's a systemic problem. It isn't GPs alone, but it is primary care pressures. It isn't mental health alone, but it is mental health pressures. It, it isn't the lack of community staff alone, district nurses, but it is those too. But the 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 the, the, the numbers of uh, vacancies in the hospital trust system is assessed by the unpublished or so far workforce assessment by the NHS England is that 154,000 uh, vacancies or the, the need for more staff is 154,000 and it's heading completely in the wrong direction. So you don't have enough uh, nurses, doctors, therapists, theatre staff in the hospital system as well. And then you have insufficient social care. So right through the system, the, the, there's in, intense pressures and you have people dying in in their homes waiting for ambulances, uh, waiting for ambulances, yeah. people it, dying in ambulances. The, uh, the, what what could happen with all of these conversations that go on where where we we are constantly saying that the NHS is failing it's failing it's failing it's failing the solution to some might be well then let's part privatize it and i can almost hear the more it fails the louder that voice gets is it deliberate um well i'm not a conspiracy theorist but how you deal with public health systems is a political choice. And there is no doubt, it, it, it isn't hidden, it's in plain view that the Conservative government and politicians for the last two or three decades or more have, have argued that they shouldn't be investing so much money in public health systems, that they, they should uh, be encouraging the private sector to come in. And actually, that, that's not the answer, because it actually takes money out of the public sector. And when the NHS was invested in adequately to the approximate level of average of comparable countries in Europe, for example, back in 2010, the NHS was not only the most effective in terms of short waits um, in A&E, very short waits for uh, elective care um, assessment and treatment within 18 weeks, but it was also deemed to be the most cost effective health service in the world. And, I, and that means you know, re very good value for money. It was costing less than the other systems. And what we've had since 2010 is, is, a, is the, the double effect of underfunding and in addition to that, promoting the, the diversion of NHS funds to the private sector. So in, instead of building And, and up, the sustainably growing population. Absolutely. I mean, it can't be yeah. ignored that we yes. may not be able to keep this status quo, even though it's failing at the moment, going uh, forever anyway. I'd love to continue talking to you, um, but I've completely run out of time. Dr Tony O'Sullivan, their co-chair of Keep Our NHS Public. So.